Well, the first broadcast was actually on <clears throat> January 31st, 1933. You'll find uh, an awful lot of reference material saying January 30th, mm -hmm. but uh, that's uh, really incorrect. And I think uh, the original date when it was put out as January 30th has just been perpetuated by people digging into some other book and just carrying uh -huh. over or plagiarizing the date. But it was actually the 31st. That was the first time the Lone Ranger was was uh, broadcast uh, out of WXYZ for the general public's consumption. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, did they do a, a test broadcast before that? It seemed that, no, I read something that you had written that there may have been a test broadcast before that. Yeah, there may have been uh, one or two broadcasts, uh, more or less uh, to uh, straighten out or, or file off a few rough edges of the scripts and stuff. That uh, is a little unclear. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Documentation and records are, are, as you probably know, Chuck, uh, very hard to get, if any, exist at all for a radio back that early. But uh, uh, the, the real production really started on the 31st and then continued three days a week you know, for the next mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, 21 years. Now, listening to The Lone Ranger in Chicago, I remember it being broadcast here uh, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evenings at uh, 6.30 Chicago time, so it would have been 7.30, I guess, in the east. Now, it was not always at that specific time uh, period, though, was it? Uh, no. Uh, as a matter of fact, that is why most people remember or have, have taken into account that the 30th was the beginning, because that would be a Monday date. Mm -hmm. uh, in the beginning, the uh, broadcast started on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. Mm. And uh, it wasn't until broadcast 150 on November 29, 1933, which was a Wednesday, that they switch over to the Monday, Wednesday, Friday broadcast. And from there on, it stayed Monday, Wednesday, Friday until the last original broadcast, which was in September of 1954. Then they started doing repeats for several years. Actually, the Lone Ranger has been in repeats uh, virtually all that time. Oh, from, ever since, From the yes. beginning, it's uh, it's been on. Uh, and, of course, it has enabled uh, new generations to uh, thrill to those thrilling days of yesteryear. Yeah, the last original broadcast, unfortunately, because it, it's, you know, like you said, it's still in syndication, it's still mm -hmm. popular, but the last original radio broadcast was September 3rd, 54. Mm -hmm. A long run for a good radio show. Uh, 3,376 broadcasts, to be precise. 3,376. Yeah. Now, how many of those broadcasts, to the best of your knowledge, uh, still survive? Well, uh, probably of the recorded shows, probably somewhere in the neighborhood of about, uh, I would say, 70, 75 percent of them. You have mm -hmm. to remember that the broadcasts from the beginning on the 31st of January, 33, were not recorded. Uh -huh. There's a lot of recordings going around saying this is the first broadcast, which what the people actually get when they see that is the 20th anniversary of the origin of the Lone Ranger, which was broadcast in 1948. Yeah. The first recorded show was January 17th, 1938. It was broadcast 776. So from there to the end of the run in September of 54, those shows were recorded. With the exception of maybe a dozen shows that were specifically not recorded for mm -hmm. a variety of reasons, uh, you end up with somewhere in the neighborhood of 2,400 uh, recorded shows, 2,500 recorded shows, and of that, there's probably maybe around 2,100 that have survived to date, uh, shipping them around the country. Some of them are on glass masters. Yeah. Uh, some of them, due to multiple stacks of, of ETs being stacked on top of another, have broken the ones on the bottoms, and they're gone. Well, that really hurts, doesn't it? Yeah, it really you hear does. stories uh, like that, in, man. In my personal collection, I, I have probably close to somewhere in the neighborhood of 17, 1,800 of them. Mm -hmm. uh, I probably have the largest single private collection of uh, you know of original material, uh, and out there with uh, in the collector's world, uh, you probably could find uh, 700, 800 of them. Mm -hmm. So you have the most complete collection, then you think? Uh, probably mm -hmm. uh, privately held. Mm -hmm. uh, matter of fact, <clears throat> I, I know for a fact that the copyright owners. Uh, and I have uh, talked for, for many years over, over my documenting the program, mm -hmm. and I do know that I have audio copies of programs that they neither have the ET, which is the electrical transcription, mm -hmm. what was recorded on, nor do they have an audio copy, nor do they have a script. So uh, there are shows that I have that I got many years ago.
before the current owners got mm-hmm, the material. Mm-hmm. And since then, those materials have been destroyed before they got them. That I actually have audio copies they don't even have. Wow. Now, you said mentioned scripts. Do, they, uh, do you have many scripts of the Lone Ranger program? Oh, yes. Uh-huh. Yes. Uh, I've gathered them for many, many years. I have uh, uh, an interesting area. I have the first 30 scripts that were done. Uh, and it's interesting in the fact Way that back from January of 33? 33, 33, right. 30 scripts? Uh, wow. It's interesting in the fact that uh, the, the first uh, uh, 10 scripts don't have Tonto. Everybody assumes Tonto uh-huh. was at the masked man's side from the beginning, but he was not. He was brought in on the 11th script um, merely as a companion to talk to to kind of explain what's going on to the radio audience. Otherwise, the ranger would be talking to his horse all the time, <laughs> being it was not yeah. a visual medium, you know. Mm-hmm. Well, that was typical in the radio. In fact, anyone who listens to radio uh, accepts that. Uh, in many cases, a character talking to himself sure. or talking to a pet or something like that. But uh, uh, it would be unlikely that the 3,300 shows could survive with the Lone Ranger talking to his horse. Uh. That's correct. <laughs> and it's interesting when you, when you read through the scripts, um, the various changes and things that either people do not remember or have long since forgotten, uh, such as Tonto did not always ride Scout. He didn't. There was a horse before mm-hmm. Scout. White Feller. White Feller? Feller, hmm. F-E-L-L-E-R. Well, that wouldn't do if the Lone Ranger's horse was uh, No, as a matter mm-hmm. of fact, uh, one of the main reasons they went to a paint was in uh, 30... Oh, I don't remember right off the top of my head, but I, I want to say it was around 1938. They uh, started uh, some of the uh, uh, radio, or, I mean, uh, movie serials. And rather than having two main characters, the Ranger and Tonto, both riding white horses, it wouldn't work for, for two reasons. One, photographically, it was too much reflection. And two, it would draw your attention uh, away from the main central character, mm-hmm. which was the Ranger. Mm-hmm. So for film purposes, they went to a paint. And at the same time, uh, they introduced... Uh, uh, the uh, Rangers or the Tonto's horse uh, in uh, July of '38 on radio, and it took about two to three broadcasts uh, on the transition. It was very low keyed, and then uh, one particular script uh, specifically named the new horse uh, Scout, and they went from there. So up to that point, had Tonto been referring to his horse as White Feller? Yes. Uh huh. But we never paid much attention to it, right? There was That's not correct. Much focus on the horse, as much of course as there was on the. On the great horse, Silver. Right. Well, Tonto came in as a device for the Lone Ranger to speak with, but, of course, he became a very important part of all of those Lone Ranger stories. Oh, that's absolutely true. Now, it was George W. Trendle out of of Detroit whose initial idea developed this program, and then... A lot of people, I guess, were involved in the in the concept making of it, but it was Fran Stryker, who was not at the station, I guess, uh, who really wrote most of these Lone Ranger stories. Is that correct? Oh, that's true. Uh, George Trendle, um, uh, by the way, the W stands for Washington, in case anybody's interested. George Sometimes w. people want to know, what's the W stand for? You, you, know? have, you have... Um, uh, uh, Incredible amount of information about it. you know what W means in trend in George <laughs> W. Trendle. That's good. I would have thought it might have stood for W X Y Z. <laughs> well, that's true. Actually, the names of the, you know when when Trendle bought the station uh, several years before the Rangers started, mm-hmm. uh, it was under a different uh, set of call letters, and they changed it to W X Y Z so they could be the last word in broadcasting. Ah, wow. <clears throat> but. Uh, uh, getting back to um, uh, the, the creation, mm-hmm. uh, and there are some avenues which get a little vague here. It is true that Trendle came up with uh, wanting a Western concept for a show, but he was very broad in his latitude as to what direction it was going to go. So he turned to Fran Stryker, who had been writing scripts uh, for a number of stations for a number of years. Fran pulled down uh, script number 10 from a series that he had written several years before called Covered Wagon Days. Mm -hmm. And he rewrote it for a central character, which would be the Ranger. But uh, so far as the development and the ideas like the silver bullets, silver horseshoes, things like that, those were pretty much Fran's uh, ideas. 
And I do have documentation on WXYZ letterhead signed by Trendle to Fran, who was living in Buffalo, New York, mm -hmm. and writing the scripts and mailing them to the station, uh, that he thought the silver bullets and silver horseshoes and things like that were a great uh, uh, ideas, uh, uh, gag uh, ideas, or however you want to interpret that, to keep those kind of uniqueness things coming. So while later that that authorship of originality did not necessarily be pointed in Fran's direction, it is nevertheless, uh, it was Fran's ideas. But uh, Fran also acknowledges the fact that if it wasn't for Mr. Trendle, for the ideas for his uh, station and, of course, his ownership and financing and everything else, the Ranger may not ever have uh, made it to the air and become as popular as it was. So there's kind of a co-ownership mm -hmm. Uh, but not any. The bulk of all of the originality does not lie in any one, uh, you know, uh, person. No, the concept was with Trendle. Yeah, he Trendle said, wanted a western. He wanted a western. He needed something to uh, mm -hmm. bolster up his uh, radio station. Uh, that's true because he was with uh, CBS and left, uh, pulled the plug on the network, and had uh, many hours of the broadcast day he needed to fill. He was mm -hmm. not going to be taking networking programming. And well, why why would he have done that? Why would he have left the, the CBS? Uh, he wasn't happy. Uh, mm -hmm. Apparently they were feeding uh, uh, some programs that he thought were, were a waste of time. Uh, he could not sell uh, uh, commercial time on. Uh, sponsorship just was not interested. And it also was taking away, uh, when you when it's like a franchise today. You pay a certain portion to the franchise holders, mm -hmm. or like network, and uh, uh, he wanted uh, more of the uh, financing to stay in his, uh, his ballpark. And he, I, I think he also felt he could do a much better job than what was being offered at that point in commercial broadcast uh, history. Well, he, and certainly, he certainly proved himself right. Yeah, I was going to say he did indeed. You know, you can have the idea to do a show like that, but you had to also have the uh, the ability, the talent. Uh, it was a to very risky like gamble. Uh -huh. A very risky gamble. Uh, they were on. Uh, they were uh, financially. They were starting to go down down the drain. Mm -hmm. And so this was a very big gamble on their part, and it paid very well. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, it's kind of interesting that on the Lone Ranger show, for the, it was sustained for a number of years, for about the first five years before uh, finally Silver Cup Bread, which is a local bread here in Detroit, uh, picked up sponsorship and ran with it for a while. But it's interesting to note that during the first 11 months, uh, there was one sponsor that was kind of pressured into uh, paying for the uh, sponsorship of the Lone Ranger, and it, they did it for about two weeks. And they left after two weeks saying that, uh, and this was the Lone Ranger show, that it was, quote, a lousy show and canceled. <laughs> well, of course, the Lone Ranger continued to outlive, apparently, the company, because the, co the company that sponsored was called Broadcast Corn Beef Hash. Uh -huh. <laughs> I don't ever remember hearing of this, pro of this product. Oh, the product of Broadcast Corn Beef Hash was a very big product in the Midwest, in, in the Chicago area especially. Uh, I can test to that. Uh, I don't know if, I really don't know if it's still around or not, but... Uh, they may have changed names. Uh, yeah, well, a lot of it does, but, <clears throat> but Broadcast Brand Corn Beef Hash was a big, uh, big product here in the, uh, in the Chicago area, at, at least. Well, the Lone Ranger, of course, did survive, and the the story of Butch Cavendish and the, uh, uh, I guess, what was it, the Hole in the Wall gang? Was that what they were called? Or uh, just yeah. the Butch Cavendish gang? Yeah, they, they, they rode out of Hole in the Wall, yeah. um, allegedly. I think it was just the Butch Cavendish gang. Yeah, and they ambushed the, the Texas Rangers and, and uh, left one uh, for dead, and, and Tonto came along and uh, nursed him back to health, and then he was the remaining ranger, or in other words, the lone ranger, and then the lone ranger and Tonto, who was really a boyhood chum, uh, continued the fight for law and order in the, the early days, as they say. That actually was not the first program in the series. You mentioned before the 20th anniversary show. It was, wasn't it the 20th anniversary where this story first appeared? Yeah, there there was some references to it during the first 15th anniversary broadcast, but the 20th uh, broadcast in 48, um, or I'm sorry, I'm sorry, in 48, which was the 15th anniversary, is where they, they really promoted the idea pretty heavily. They repeated it for the 20th anniversary. Oh, I see. But in 48, they also did, uh, they turned uh, Cheyenne, Wyoming, into Lone Rangerville, Wyoming, for one day. No. And they... Uh, 
went ahead and did a whole uh, Wild West Days. And uh, during that day, they did a separate broadcast during the day with the governor and everybody in, and then they did a different broadcast at night. But during that day, they really promoted the fact of, of uh, the whole basic idea of the the ambush mm-hmm. and the killing of all except one in town of finding the ranger and stuff. That's slightly different on how the story originally started, but uh, that's the one that all of us remember now. A very high standard, uh, mm-hmm. both moral-wise, respect for others, law-abiding. Uh, Fran kept ex- extreme uh, close vigilance uh, on the scripts, especially if they were being worked by any of the other writers at WXYZ, to make sure that the ranger spoke with only correct, perfect diction, never slurs, never uh, slang uh, in the film uh, versions on television and the movies, impeccable uh, cleanliness on clothing, uh, you know, uh, mm-hmm. A straight shooter right down the line. A yeah. very good uh, standard by which uh, to uh, to uh, a good example for a young audience, right, for any a young audience, audience to America. aspire to. Uh-huh. Uh, speaking of the Lone Ranger being a straight shooter, uh, now he, I guess he only killed one person in his long career, right? Uh, that was in a book uh, uh-huh. in uh, 1939. The, the title escapes me right off the top of my head. But yes, uh, in the book, it bears it out that he very, with a vengeance, went after somebody very viciously. And I think once they uh, decided uh, that wasn't the, really the way to go. Uh-huh. And so they, they never again approached uh, that directness of, uh, of a confrontation. As, I, as a kid, remember listening to The Lone Ranger, and still today listening to The Lone Ranger. When he shoots, he never shoots to kill. He shoots to wing, right? He shoots to, to wing, wing the guy. Uh, or wound as uh, yeah. lightly as possible. Right. Mostly or... to try to shoot the gun out of the other guy's hand. Right, right. right. <laughs> well, they draw was... their attention away yeah. for a moment right. until they can right. physically get a hold of him, you know. Now, uh, we only have a couple of seconds left, but uh, uh, over the years, there were many bad guys on this show who wanted to unmask the Lone Ranger. I mean, they, the Lone Ranger came to the brink of being unmasked many, many times. Uh, was he ever unmasked by anyone who lived to tell about it? He was never unmasked by force. The Lone Ranger did unmask himself voluntarily several times. Now, was that when he put on his prospector's uh, disguise or whatever and went into town? No, I'm talking about a full unmasked no disguise. Ah. There was a little girl Uh who befriended him many years before who knew his his identity. There was the padre at the mission that the, that uh, was w- one of the few people that knew exactly who the ranger was. He also unmasked himself during the Legion of the Black Arrow series to President Grant in a railroad sighting in St. Louis. Uh-huh. And, of course, uh, w- the other person that knew him intimately besides Tonto was the miner who m- worked the Reed Brothers Silver Mine, which provided the silver oh, yes. bullets, uh-huh. silver horseshoe, and all the traveling expenses that the ranger would need you know, uh, his per diem expenses, if you will. <laughs> uh, and he was the only other person. Do you remember his name? No, I can't remember his name. Jim Blaine. Jim Blaine. Wow. And he worked the... the now, was he uh, was he a, a former Texas Ranger also? He was also? a former Texas Ranger mm-hmm. that had retired and uh, worked the mine for the Reed Brothers. Of course, uh, you know, John was the only one surviving after the Cavendish uh, uh, ambush. But uh, the understanding mm-hmm. that uh, that uh, Jim had with the Lone Ranger was that the Lone Ranger told me he could have all the silver he wanted as long as he could at least furnish the, the Lone Ranger his immediate living expenses. And so in trade for mining, the, uh-huh. he, he got all the other proceeds that Jim would want. And, of course, Jim, being a very honorable man, never took advantage of the Lone Ranger. He got pension and welfare and... Uh... He may even have gotten a dental plan. I'm not sure. <laughs> Well, if he did, of course, he didn't have any gold fillings. They had to be silver, right? That's right. And you know, do you, do you remember where the entrance to the silver mine was? No, I don't. It was through a bottom of a false floor in a bunk in the Reed Brothers' 
ranch house. Oh, gee, I didn't know that at all. Yeah, there was no visible outside opening to the silver mine. Now, there's a lot of similarity. I wish we had time to go into this, but there are a lot of similarities between the Lone Ranger in his story and the Green Hornet in his story. Because oh, yes. The, the Green Hornet had a sliding panel in uh, in a room in his home to find his uh, the car, the Black Beauty, right? Right. That's another story for us to talk about sometime. And there's a direct family lineage there, so we'll have to get into that's that another we'll have, time. That'll, that'll be an, an amazing... This is a cliffhanger now, Terry. By the way, yeah. just to leave your audience uh, with a little bit of local <laughs> questioning, who played the Ranger in an independent production in Chicago? You know, in the early days, they had four or five or six stations that mm-hmm. were doing co-productions at the same time with different casts in different cities. This was before networks. Who played the Lone Ranger from WGN while it was produced in New York? You mean in a separate production? In a separate production. My there gosh. was a very famous actor that played the Lone Ranger out of the WGN studios in the fall of uh, 33. I can see that it would be useless to get into a trivia contest with you, so I'll have to ask you to tell us. I don't know who that would be. Silent film screen star Francis, Francis X. Bushman. Bushman. Oh, boy. Yeah, he was acting in the Chicago area for some time. Wow. So um, that is more trivia for our audience tonight to know a little bit more about the Lone Ranger. And uh, you are an incredible uh, resource for the Lone Ranger, and I know you're, uh, you're always doing a lot of, a lot of digging, uh, finding new things constantly, and uh, you're a great resource to all of us in, the, in Radio Land uh, about this particular subject. And, of course, it's not your only interest in, in old-time radio. I know, Terry, you're very much interested in, as so many of us are, in the, the entire history of the, uh, the great days of radio. It's a, go- it's, it's, it's a hobby that got out of control. Well, tell me about it. I know all about that sort of thing. What do you do in real life, Terry? Uh, I'm somewhat pseudo-retired now, and I do uh, broadcast, uh, uh, original broadcasts. Like uh, a couple weeks ago, we were down in Mount Carmel, which is the birthplace of Brace Beamer, mm-hmm. and we did a re-enactment uh, of a Lone Ranger broadcast with Fred Foy, who oh, played the uh-huh. role one time in 54, and we <clears throat> re uh, Recreated that uh, that individual broadcast and redid it live. Fred Foy, the announcer on the show, actually played the Ranger on one episode. Yes. Why would he do that? Uh, Brace Beamer, show August 29, mm-hmm. 1954. As a matter of fact, was the broadcast and the script was Burley Scott's sacrifice. And Brace Beamer, that particular day, had laryngitis. Oh, see, so sleeping, Fred sleeping outside did, did on the road one time. Mm-hmm. And Bray uh-huh. said he would never lose his voice again. <laughs> he was afraid, huh? Right. But we have the actual audio of that particular broadcast, and then uh, I wrote the script uh, for the recreation, mm. and we went down to Mount Carmel and uh, recreated it with Fred. He came in from New York. And uh, Dick Beals, who used to play children's voices mm-hmm. on The Lone Ranger, and uh, a sound effects man by the name of Barney Beck out of New York, who's retired he did sound effects on Gangbusters and The Shadow and a lot of other shows. He did the sound effects. I, very fortunately, did not make too many mistakes in assisting uh, in the sound effects. So I didn't make anybody look bad. <laughs> but I had a lot of fun doing that. Uh, sounds good. And uh, so we do that, and we uh, provide uh, radio programming to various organizations of old-time radio. Mm-hmm. And we continue to find, discover, preserve, and transfer from discs before they get any more damage to tape, thousands of radio shows a year. Uh, our, our personal holdings are probably well over 100,000 shows right wow, now. Wow. Lots of stuff. And a lot of writing. Mm-hmm. And, of course, I'm in the process now of rewriting the Lone Ranger log, which hopefully I'll be able to broadcast log for radio, which hopefully I'll have done uh, in about two years. It's not a quick project, is it? Uh, no, the original law took me eight years to put together wow. to find uh, all 3,376 shows or titles or synopsis or whatever. And I had a few that I couldn't find. I now have found them. I now know even more information than before. And I'm in the process of a very long rewrite. And I don't think it'll ever be released in its complete form. Mm-hmm. It'll probably be close to 900 pages in length. But we'll, we'll make available to some, somewhere along the line a more manageable size for oh, yeah. the uh, person who's, uh, you know, interested in it. Terry, I know a lot of people are interested, and I know maybe some of our listeners might like to contact you about the Lone Ranger or some of these other things. you have a uh, an address where someone can write to you if they'd like to? Uh, sure. 
P.O. Box 347. Post Office Box 347. And that's Howell, H-O-W-E-L-L, Michigan. Mm -hmm. Howell, Michigan. 48844. 48844. Terry Salmonson, that's S-A-L-O-M-O-N-S-O-N, Box 347. Howell, H-O-W-E-L-L, Michigan, 48844. So if someone has a, a story they want to tell you about the Lone Ranger, you'll be glad to uh, open an envelope and read about it. Or uh, if someone needs uh, some more information, or maybe you can get some information, uh, it all helps uh, build uh, what we're trying to do, right? Oh, absolutely. And if there's information that comes forth that we can use in the law, we'll be more than happy to, uh, to add to the credits. Uh, of the various people that have helped me over the years, there's always something that we haven't heard about or seen. Mm -hmm. uh, that's how I got the various names of all the different actors that played the Lone Ranger over the years uh, in independent productions. You know, there were about uh, close to a dozen of them, mm -hmm. of which most people only remember two or three. Is your existing log available to anyone who's interested yeah, in having it? The log, that, of course, I'm in the process of doing an update, and yeah. it will take several years. But, yeah, there is a log available. It's 106 pages long. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, uh, I can make a, you know, copies available for those that are interested in it. Okay. So if someone wants to know about it, or you would just want to talk about it, you want to... Uh, is there a, obviously there's got to be some kind of a fee for this? So what do you charge? For well, that unfortunately, run? the printers don't always print and provide for free. Yeah, so right. We have to charge, <laughs> and I don't charge, uh, mm -hmm. you know, much beyond what it costs to, to reproduce a, a log. And in this case, it's pretty sizable; it's 106 pages mm -hmm. long. So the uh, the fee is uh, 17.95, and that includes postage and handling and all that other good oh, stuff. Oh, okay. So this is a, a rather complete log of all the 3,376 Lone Ranger broadcasts, right? Yeah. There's only a few that I don't have in that particular mm -hmm. log dated or synopsis, mm -hmm. although I will try to put that together just to fill that little gap in. But, yeah, all 3,376 shows are there, dates, times, of broadcast, who played what, writers, the directors, a brief history of... of of uh, how the shows were numbered and dated and where the recording started and and uh it's a nice log we do a lot of logs we've we've also done logs on uh, yours truly johnny dollar escape mm -hmm. uh dragnet the green hornet challenge of the yukon and we're working on uh, a dozen more of major shows right. we never really announced the titles until the logs are done well if someone wants general information on all that maybe if they write to you and send you a self-addressed stamped envelope then sure. you can give them oh, more information helps. about that yeah that helps Let's see. i get a lot of mail a year <laughs> i get to keeps keeps going up. yeah right all right uh terry salmonson s-a-l-o-m-o-n-s-o-n box 347 howell michigan 48844 and maybe some of uh, our Lone Ranger fans in the uh, Chicago area or throughout the country who get to tune us in here on WBBM will be uh, checking with you uh, further about some of the great uh, Lone Ranger and other things. Terry, I appreciate very much you spending some time with us today. It's uh, always a pleasure to chat with you. I know you're a super Lone Ranger fan among the a fan of so many other radio shows. Thanks very much for being with us. My pleasure, Chuck. Uh, anytime. Thank you very much.